clean O2 is converting carbon dioxide emissions from buildings into valuable high margin consumer and industrial products. We have the co-founders Jason, Kathy and Scott with us today. Thanks a lot for joining in guys. Thank you for having us. So, uh, so I've been reading about you guys, uh, you know, in the past couple of days and it seems like you're creating a new product category altogether. Um, so I'll, I'll come back to that, but you know, let's first talk about what is the problem that you are trying to solve at uh, Clean O2 and, and why is that uh, a big problem? Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll start with that. So, uh, uh, in Canada, roughly 25% of the greenhouse gas emissions generated in this country come from uh, the heating industry. Okay. Uh, in the United States, that's roughly 12%. And then while that sounds like it's less, uh, you know, 12% of anything in the United States is, uh, is a pretty massive number. Right. Uh, when people talk about carbon emissions, they generally think of large emitters like power generation, Mm -hmm. or the transportation industry or some of the other industrial sector, but the aggregated sources of uh, GHGs are generally overlooked. So that's where we come in. We, we look at the aggregated uh, points of uh, production of CO2 and have created a, uh, a unique solution for the heating industry to help decarbonize and reduce these emissions. Okay, okay, okay. And, and in, in which sectors basically it comes like heating industry. So is it like split across different, different consumer sectors? Yeah. So we're, we're primarily focused in the commercial heating space okay. uh, currently. So right now uh, to put that into perspective, yeah. you would be, uh, you, know, you would, you would see our technology in uh, aggregated residential applications like townhomes and condominium complexes, uh, recreation centers, hotels, okay. uh, commercial laundry facilities, anything that you can think of that would have uh, use for natural gas for the purposes of generating heat uh, in that in that scale. That's that's where we're primarily focused at the moment. Okay. Okay. Perfect. And uh, so, how do you make you? consumer and industrial products out of this and you know what was the re reason behind uh, doing that yeah so we uh originally when we started developing our business model it was based on um an arbitrage play of commodities where we would plug in a, an inexpensive chemical into our system okay. and then by adding carbon dioxide to it would convert it into a high value commodity okay. um, However, in, in, in realizing that, we, 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 end, we, cut, we came to understand that, uh, that the margins of that commodity arbitrage play was not as robust as we had anticipated. Okay. So we were left with making some hard choices of, you know, either, you know, wrapping it up and saying, well, you know, job well done. Uh, technology uh, works, but uh, we can't make a business out of it. Uh, or we get creative and find a solution that uh, that would allow our our business to thrive. So that was the path that we decided to take. So quite, you know, it's only been about a year, but we've uh, we've dialed into uh, into the soap and detergent industry. And I remember having conversations with both Kathy and Scott, and okay. being quite adamant about, you know, we're not a soap company. Right. <laughs> that's not that's not our thing there's no way you know hell we're going to be a soap company i i was adamant about it. we had made some bars of soap just as a marketing tool it was just a uh, product where we wanted to engage the public to help them understand what carbon capture could translate into so okay we knew that the chemical that we were producing was used in the soap and detergent industry so we thought well you know soap and detergent is fairly straightforward so let's go out and make some, and that's what we did. We uh, we actually wanted to uh, to play off of a, a Fight Club, you know, you know that scene where Ed Norton's holding that pink bar of soap, you know, you know. So we thought we'd maybe try to to play in that space, but then you know, there's obviously some copyright infringement issues. So um, so yeah, we just we created a small batch of, of soap, and and to be honest, it was horrible soap. <laughs> it was. It was more just for marketing than it was actually. I think I used it. Uh, we used uh, 
canola oil because you know we wanted to be locally sourced and uh, it was just horrible it was it was god awful so right. um but then you know we started working with local suppliers of soap products that made a um, far superior product and and it took off it, it it was remarkable still remarkable i i uh had never i don't think any of us in our wildest dreams had anticipated that this this project that we've been working on for 15 years would eventually turn into a soap company. I, so that, I don't, that you, you, couldn't, part, don't you couldn't predict this. No. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and none of you have any experience in, in uh, production in general, like production of tangible products in general. No, no, we're no, learning as we all. go. <laughs> it's, yeah. <laughs> That's was, for sure. Yeah. No, no experience. No, no experience in this space at all. Okay, okay, okay. And, and what's your journey like? How do you guys, you know, know each other, and and what prompted you to sort of embark on, on this journey? Well, it started oh. with started with Scott, I think. Well, no, I guess it started with yeah. Well, no, it started with Scott. Yeah, and I, you know, as I said, he he hired me and. We had this awesome job opportunity where I could go and, you know, I love working on plumbing and heating systems. And uh, he had guys that had been working for him for, you know, over a decade, which is a good indication that he, you know, he looked after his, his crew. And uh, that's, that's exactly what I found being on there. And, uh, and as I said, to his, to his credit, you know, if you hire somebody to do a job, that's what you're expecting them to do. But, you know, you hire this guy, and, you know, almost immediately, he's like, hey, I've got an idea. I want to explore it. Do you want to, do you want to try something? And instead of saying, no, <laughs> you're a plumber. I hired you to be a plumber. Right. Go plumb. Go, go fix things. Right. He said, okay, sure. Yeah, give it a, give it a shot. And um yeah, it was just remarkable. And then, uh, so along the way, uh, Scott uh, connected me with uh, some people in his network, and which led me to, uh, uh, from XLR Mechanical to Specify, where uh, Kathy uh, is a part owner of. And um, I walked in through the back door of her, uh, of her office, and I asked who the biggest chemistry nerd was. And it was unanimous. Everybody pointed fingers at Kathy. <laughs> So uh, originally, the project was just supposed to get us into uh, uh, popular mechanics. So they had a, a contest called uh, DIY 2.0. Okay. So it was for back, you know, garage mechanics and basement tinkerers, and we thought, you know, I thought, well, you know, maybe we can go get our 15 minutes of fame, and all of us can go get our face in uh, popular mechanics, and hey. let's play around with it, and then. Um, yeah, here, here we are 15 years later and <laughs> we're still not in popular mechanics, but we've, no. we've, we've, <laughs> we've, we've done some picture different. in there. Just saying. We took it in a completely different direction. <laughs> yeah. And Kathy and Scott, like what, what keeps you guys, you know, motivated to work on this like every day? Well, I, I guess for, for me, um, it, it's, one of those things people keep saying, oh, you haven't given up yet. It's like, no, not quite yet. Not, not ready. And of course, Jason doesn't give up. So uh, the rest of us, you know, can't either. Um, but chemistry has always been kind of my thing. And I also had many years in the heating industry. So, uh, so it was, it's kind of one of those things. I it, it just, I see where it can go and I just don't want to give up. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. What, what about you, Scott? Well, for me, I'm a, I'm an entrepreneur at heart. So, um, Jason was, was interested in this and I, uh, I was interested in this and, and Kathy all on board. So I just, I'm not going to let it die and, and nobody would let it die. And Maybe. it's hard to say no to Jason. Look at him. <laughs> <laughs> so, Can't say no to a bald guy. <laughs> no. A big bald guy at that. But, uh, so on we went and no one, no one prepared to give up and, and just get to it. So here we are still going. Here we are, still going. Exactly. Awesome. That's that's really inspirational. That's really inspirational. And uh, I'm sure, like 15 years, you guys will have faced uh, a lot of challenges to you know reach uh, to this stage. But 
but what have been you know some of the biggest ones and uh, if i put it otherwise like if you have to advise companies who are uh, just getting started in the clean tech space uh, what what would your advice be to them based on the challenges that you have faced i'm sure there would be many like if you have to choose the top 3 yeah i guess uh, i mean um uh, yeah i think be prepared to um push yourself beyond what you think your limits are um and 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 be persistent don't yes don't give up mm-hmm. now and, and i always feel i always feel like there's a there's a cautionary tale there because i've seen a lot of you know people that are in this space trying to make something go and from my perspective looking at it and from other people's looking at their projects you're like well that isn't going to go anywhere but that's you know that's a that's a personal call mm-hmm. that i think the entrepreneur has to make i don't think anybody can make that call but that entrepreneur and but they also have to you know you're going to sacrifice things mm-hmm. you're going to sacrifice friends you're going to sacrifice family time with them mm-hmm. um you're going to sacrifice comfort of paychecks when i left xlr <laughs> i had a great job i was making a i was making good money uh i had a solid relationship with customers i enjoyed it tremendously and then i left and there were many times where i you know looked back and like i don't know if this was the right choice mm-hmm. i really don't know if this was the right choice especially when you stop collecting those steady paychecks mm-hmm. and sometimes you go months without a paycheck and no sign of of getting paid you get people you know after you for for cash like you've just got to push through it you have to find a way to push through it but be patient and don't just don't give up don't give up and i would i would say to get ready for for criticism because there's going to be a lot of it yeah. and you got to develop a, a thick skin because there's going to be a lot of people that are saying that ah, it's not going to work but if you're if you're passionate about it and you 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 see a future then you know definitely persist yeah cuz someday it'll it'll get you where you want to be right right and how has you know the support been for you guys like in terms of support from the government support from the community support from the startup community has has that been helpful in you know helping you reach where you are uh, today It's it started uh, off not the not greatest so but uh, it's it you know just kind of getting them on board with with our with our our game plan and and uh um you know but I I see now it has definitely progressed we have gotten some help from the government for getting things moving Yeah I mean you know whether you're an investor or a government agency or just the general public as you start to de-risk your idea you are going to get more people on board that's just the natural progression of things and it can be a really wild and crazy idea that everybody's going to look at it and say that never work mm-hmm. but as you stick with it and you overcome problems and you solve issues mm-hmm. you also bring people on board who who see what you see mm-hmm. and they're able to recognize that oh well okay maybe there is something here and then they and then and then there's less criticism and then there's more support like as Kathy said we we've, we've certainly seen an uptick in the last 12 months of um uh, interest and in people wanting to help from investment as well as from government agencies but right off the bat mm-hmm. yeah that was a tough sell <laughs> it was a yeah. really tough sell that's for sure i can imagine and i think with with selling tangible products it becomes and being like a capital intensive business yeah exactly yeah exactly yeah so uh like being in the clean tech space what do you guys think has it been is it still difficult for you to convince people that um, i mean like climate change is is real the problem is real and the solutions need to be built around that quickly is is that there so- are the, the, there there is some pushback cuz as you know there are people out there that don't believe in climate change or or they don't want to uh see that future that <laughs> scientists are seeing okay. but um you know but there there is still a a great group of people that do believe and do want to be a part of the solution mm-hmm. so 
it's it it's, it comes and goes. I don't know. Yeah, and I think the the spin on this here is is two twofold. One, uh, we occupy sort of the middle ground where. Yeah. I mean, the, t the topic of climate change and carbon emissions is a very polarizing subject matter. Mm -hmm. I think it's important for us as a, as a group of, you know, concerned people that we want to occupy the middle ground. We don't want to be, you know, fall into the alarmist trap of, of doom and gloom. But we also don't want to be falling into the ignorant trap of, of, uh, of ignoring the problem and just thinking it'll just go away. Um, I think when we do that, when we create a polarizing environment surrounding issues associated with climate change, you, you end up not engaging in any constructive criticism. You just, or conversations rather, you just surround yourself with people who have similar bias and then you're not accomplishing anything, you know? So I think we, we occupy that space between both sides where, you know, we we want to be constructive in generating solutions that have real world benefits right. to reducing carbon emissions because it is an important thing that needs to be addressed, but mm -hmm. it needs to be reasonable, it needs to be realistic, and it needs to be uh, meaningful in, in how we and how we progress in, in that For sure. avenue. And we also we do that through uh, uh, changing the, the conversation around how our technology interfaces with our customers' heating systems. Like, if, if climate change and carbon emissions is not a big issue for you and it's the last, it's a very low ranking subject matter on your, you know, checklist of things to look after in your, in your building, we answer a number of other issues that are, you know, a concern. So operating expenditures, for example, okay. if you're paying for a gas bill, why don't we come in and make your, your system more efficient so you're spending less money Okay. Uh, on a monthly basis uh, for energy bills. Um, it's it's mechanical maintenance. It's getting a set of eyes into your mechanical room on a regular basis, making sure that your system is running properly. Mm -hmm. And then uh, lastly, of course, the most important part is the fact that, you know, if we're cutting you a check at the end of every year as part of your profit sharing mechanism from this waste stream of gas that you're producing, mm -hmm. does it really matter what your position on climate change is? I would say yes, it does. But from a from a business perspective, if if you get a check from from a company and it, it all it cost you was the upfront cost of the equipment, well, mm -hmm. you know, it makes it a very it, it's a far more challenging conversation to have about you know mm -hmm. what climate change actually means if you're getting paid to deal with the gas that you don't care about. Mm -hmm. Interesting, interesting, and. Like, do you guys plan to or do you run any awareness campaigns in, in that direction? Um, yeah, I mean, we've got, uh, we've recently hired a, uh, a communications team to uh, make sure that that messaging is coming across clearly and, and fairly and on point with what we're trying to accomplish. So, uh, you know, it, in, in building a business, you have to recognize that you aren't going to be great at everything. So you have to surround yourself with people who can fill in the gaps, yeah. right? So I'm, I'm, I'm not a communications guy. I just, you know, I, I, I know what I know when I, when I talk about it openly, but you know, uh, when it comes to speaking to these key points on a broader subject matter, it's best to bring in people who can make sure that what we're trying to relate to the public is on point with what we're trying to say instead of it being misunderstood or misconstrued. Okay. Okay. Well, That's a great uh, communications guy. He's fantastic. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and lastly, uh, guys, I just wanted to ask like what, what lies ahead for, for you guys, you know, I'm, I don't want to like put a timeline to it because Everything these days is, is so so dynamic, but uh, but what lies ahead for Clean O2 as a company? Well, that's a tough one. Just <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, uh, I mean, our mandate is to decarbonize the heating industry. Okay. That's our mandate. Uh, we've got independent reviews of our technology that have indicated uh, supported our claim to reduction of greenhouse gas emissions by twenty percent. Mm -hmm. uh, our goal is to get to 50% by the end of next year. And then long-term, 
the next five to eight years, we want to get to 100%. We think that there's a pathway through supporting uh, the hydrogen economy. I think um, for heating purposes, specifically in the retrofit industry, uh, hydrogen is just a natural fit. The infrastructure is there. The conversion is fairly straightforward. Um, it's certainly going to be an easier pathway forward than electrification for the retrofit. Uh, of the heating industry, mm -hmm. uh, so that's what we're that's where we're pointing the company. That's the direction that we're taking. But as Kathy said, I mean, in terms of specifics, we, we live in a COVID world. We travel restrictions. Um, I mean, there's a lot of <laughs> unknown variables, but that's that's the direction that we're taking. Awesome, awesome. That's that's good to know. Uh, well, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, guys, for for joining in today and and sharing uh, all those insights. I mean, I I learned a lot just by just by reading about you guys and and what you're making. And I was I was seriously awestruck by most of the things that 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 you're doing. I mean, uh, there's this carbon emission on one side, and then soaps on detergents. So I, it took me a bit of time to to digest and you know uh, bridge these two things in in my head. Plus learned a lot like by just talking to you here. So thanks a lot to all of you for joining in today. Well, thanks for having us. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.